and he is worthy of our best, isn't he? Amen. Let's go ahead and please have uh, have a seat. Junior Church can be uh, dismissed uh, downstairs with uh, Miss Sarai. Uh, we're in Acts chapter 1, so if you'd find Acts chapter 1 uh, in your Bible. Acts chapter 1. There is no choir practice tonight. I thought you reminded that there is no choir practice tonight. Acts chapter number one. Now, the book of Acts written by Luke. Uh, Luke uh, was one that traveled with uh, with the Apostle Paul as he would uh, would travel and start churches. And, and as God used him to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, uh, he wrote the gospel of Luke to a man called Theophilus, a uh, Roman uh, leader, and, and he wrote it as a gospel track. He wrote it to persuade uh, this ro Roman leader uh, in uh, the uh, gospel of Jesus Christ to be saved. And, and, and so he, he wrote uh, there, and, and, and the Acts is a follow-up, uh, a continual, uh, you know, as, as it gives as, as the spread of the gospel and, of course, the uh, uh, results, what, uh, you know, uh, what took place as the, the church started uh, Acts is a history of the, the, the New Testament church, of the local church, and, and of course how it began at Pentecost and, and uh, it, uh, or began, it uh, was, was, was there before, but it got empowered by the Holy Spirit uh, there uh, and uh, uh, continued and grew and spread. The gospel spread. Churches began to, uh, to uh, grow in other places, not just in Jerusalem, and as the gospel began to scatter. And of course Paul's missionary travels as he uh, would uh, would uh, travel and preach the gospel and start churches and also as a record of his uh, his uh, time in prison and and, and uh, all those uh, things included in that and so uh, so uh, Luke uh, is writing this as a follow up to the gospel according to Luke uh, that was written through Theophilus and and uh, we know uh, it's by inspiration it's God's word and uh, and so uh, Luke is writing these things because God is directing uh, him to write this and and uh, and that's why it's recorded down for us uh, even today. Uh, here in, in uh, Luke chapter 1, the Bible says, The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, speaking of the gospel according to Luke, uh, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, uh, until the day which, in which he was taken up, after uh, that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. And you'll find chapter 1 is a record of that, but also at the end of the book of Luke. Uh, as Jesus spent those last days with the apostles before he was caught up. And so he says that uh, former treatise that I delivered unto you was a record of Christ's life here upon the earth and, and his death, burial, resurrection, and, of course, his ascension back into heaven, uh, the last message, the great commission he gave to the apostles. And, uh, and so uh, now he begins from there in Luke chapter number 1 as well. And uh, verse number 3 the Bible says, to whom also he showed himself, speaking of Jesus, showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Uh, it wasn't uh, that Jesus uh, rose again and somebody gave a testimony. Hey, I saw Jesus alive and now he's gone to heaven. The Bible says for 40 days uh, he uh, traveled around, he preached, he talked to people, he made himself available Anyone who wanted to see, did Jesus really rise from the grave? They could have went and talked to him. They could have saw him. They could have spent time with him. And, and uh, for uh, 40 days, the Bible says in 1 in Corinthians that at one time there was 500 present at one time that he showed himself to them. So there'd be no doubt, nobody to uh, begin to spread lies and things and say, oh, he really didn't rise from the grave. That's just what the disciples are saying. And, uh, uh, and that's why that did not take place, because he says by many infallible proofs, uh, he uh, showed himself, and and uh, so as we uh, we look at uh, the uh, uh, the uh, account, and and uh, of course there in Luke as he finished, and and uh, but uh, it says here, and in, in, again in verse number three, uh, as he did, verse number three it says, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, and uh, you know I've heard of the passion of Christ in uh, Missouri. We had uh, there in in uh, Branson, Missouri, they have a play that. It's kind of an ongoing that you can go down and see. It's, it's actually people travel from all over to see it, but it's called the Passion Play. Uh, and it's about the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and uh, if, uh, I've heard in songs talking about the Passion of Christ. And uh, there's even a book entitled The Passion of Christ. And, 
And uh, we uh, we come to this uh, term, the, the passion of Christ. Hadn't really, uh, you know, just spent too much time just thinking about uh, the passion of uh, Christ. And and uh, and yes, as uh, just uh, reading through the book of Acts and and uh, came uh, to that and, and just kind of stopped right there. The Holy Spirit said just camp right there. And and I'd like to uh, talk about the passion of of Christ as I was uh, reading this and of course what's the passion of Christ is talking about the crucifixion uh, the crucifixion as he went to the cross uh, to die for us and and uh, just looking at uh, this uh, you know passion is not really a term that I would use to refer to suffering uh, myself that's not really something I mean uh, in my thinking you know passion uh, you know uh, isn't isn't dealing with uh, with uh, suffering and and uh, yet here we find the Bible uses the term uh, passion and uh, in fact, every other time this this uh, word is used in the Greek uh, in the New Testament is translated suffering, uh, suffering. And uh, and so, uh, you know, here uh, dealing with suffering, I, I really don't associate passion with suffering or didn't. Of course, I do now uh, in uh, just uh, studying this, the scripture. But uh, but uh, here a uh, uh, passion uh, again, this this word that is used here in Greek is is uh, the same term. It's used in many other places in the Bible to refer to as suffering. So they, they would uh, translate in English the term suffering. But here they translated it passion. And uh, in uh, this particular, and I, I praise the Lord for the King James Version of the Bible. And, and I thank the Lord for the translators and for the, uh, the work they did. And it's very difficult to translate from one language uh, to another. How do you choose words in a different language to convey the exact same meaning uh, as uh, those in a different language? And uh, just to get around my wife a while while she's talking to her sisters. And I always think of this when it comes to interpretation. And uh, uh, but uh, she, she'll be on the phone. She'll be laughing. I mean, her, her side's hurting. She's crying uh, because she's laughing so hard. And and uh, so I'll interrupt. I got to know what this is. So I'll ask, you know, what are you guys laughing about? She says, oh, it's a joke. And, and uh, you know, uh, Lucy, she's the one telling jokes. But uh, it's a joke, as she told. And and uh, and so uh, uh, and uh, well, what's the joke? And so she'll tell me the joke and. That's funny. Uh, makes no sense in English. And, uh, you know, it's just it's, it's kind of hard to convey, uh, you know, the exact same. And and of course, as, as the uh, translator trying to put uh, in the in the context here and the term that's used and the way it's used, what is the equivalent uh, in English to be able to say? And they uh, and they put down the word passion. And uh, the only time you'll find the word passion given to us in the New Testament and and uh, this uh, uh, referring to uh, the passion of Christ. And and so uh, again, verse three, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. I thank you, Father, for the opportunity to just look into your word. And, and uh, Father, set our eyes upon your son, Jesus Christ, again. Uh, we uh, we tend to get carried away in our lives and uh, as Christians the longer that we're saved we we take for granted uh, Lord as we consider uh, your son Jesus Christ many times it's good for us to uh, come and reflect and and uh, just spend some time meditating upon uh, your son and the price that he paid uh, for our sins in, in Calvary the love that you have uh, for us I pray father you bless the message this morning and uh, Lord that our uh, appreciation and our love would be strengthened uh, this morning as we uh, we consider what uh, your son uh, has done for us. It's in Jesus name we pray. Amen. I want to read some things about this term passion and uh, the Greek word is pasho. Uh, pasho uh, is is the Greek term and and uh, again the uh, just uh, writing about this this uh, particular uh, word that uh, is used uh, the precise origin of the word is uncertain uh, it is known that the verb originally indicated and, and the experience of, of some outside stimulus that affected one's emotions in either a positive or a negative way so it can be used positively it can be used negatively uh, and uh, the context determined the precise character of the response uh, gradually, pasho came to be qualified with additional words to express a positive sense, while pasho alone denoted a negative emotion. Furthermore, rather than simply denoting uh, emotions, pasho expressed bearing or enduring hardship. Thus, the translation in many places in the Bible, suffer, uh, suffer or sufferings, uh, dealing with enduring hardship. Uh, passion, some synonyms. 
uh, words that are uh, similar in meaning. Uh, top of the list, suffering. Uh, but then it goes along a little bit more, m- maybe what we're familiar with as we come to passion, excitement. Uh, this word you're probably not. I'd look up the definition, but perturbation. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I, I tried to, to see how it was spelled right, I mean pronounced, but uh, perturbation. Uh, it means agitation of mind, uh, agitation of mind, uh, and a desire, uh, passion, uh, a desire. Uh, and uh, some examples, fear, hope, joy, grief, love, hatred, or zeal. Uh, all could be used uh, there with, uh, with passion. Uh, passion is a very strong feeling about a person or thing. Passion is an intense emotion, not just an emotion, but an intense emotion. Emotion. We see the word passion, and people use the word passion. They're usually talking about an intense motion. Uh, when you refer to somebody as sure passionate about some hobby, passionate about their job, uh, passionate about uh, you know uh, uh, some guy, passionate about a girl. Uh, it's it, it's a str- it's it's referring to a strong emotion. Uh, we have used negatively crimes of passion, uh, and uh, many times even used in courtrooms to. Define it as a crime of passion to try to remove uh, the sentence of murder to a, a lesser uh, form of, uh, of, of degree of murder. And, and uh, so they'd say that was a crime of passion. And uh, so as we look at, at that word passion, a very strong uh, emotion, intense emotion, compelling enthusiasm or desire for something. Uh, they can be so strong as to inhibit all practice of personal freedom. In other words, it takes control of you, uh, all practice of personal freedom, because it's such a strong emotion, uh, they're passionate about. Many times people are passionate about something, they forget the consequences. They forget, uh, you know, uh, many of the things in their life. If you're p- passionate about some particular hobby or things, then uh, everything else in your life kind of goes, uh, you know, un- unheeded and, and uh, to, to be passionate. And uh, uh, this uh, inclination or so-called disposition of the soul is born of the opinion we hold that a great good or a great evil is contained in an object which in and of itself arouses passion. Uh, You can have a passion to destroy something. Uh, Ladies, you can can be passionate about your house. You can have a passion to destroy that dirt. And you can scrub it till it's gone. And and in a lot of different ways we can use this term passion. And, and, And the Bible uses this term referring to Christ as he went to the cross to pay for our sins and, and just to consider this morning as we uh, give praise to our Lord Jesus Christ, his passion for souls, his passion for souls. Why is it that he went to the cross? It was his passion for you and I, his passion for souls that uh, that uh, enabled him to uh, to uh, face the cross. Uh, look with me to Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, we're just going to do a Bible study, some some verses of scripture to look up uh, this morning. And uh, and so if you would, uh, if you don't have a Bible, grab the Bible in front of you there in the pew uh, or uh, uh, two pews up if you need to uh, and uh, or uh, look with the, the person next to you. But uh, Isaiah there in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter number 53. Many times in, in uh, at the top of chapters, it'll give you just kind of a short uh, note about what the chapter is about. Uh, Isaiah 53 above mine says his passion and the good success thereof. His passion and the good success thereof. And and uh, here in Isaiah chapter number 53. And this is a a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ, God who sees the end from the beginning, already seeing the crucifixion taking place. And uh, he, he records here uh, exactly took place. The death, burial, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Actually, the uh, the. Uh, uh, taking upon the flesh as a man, death, burial, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, in verse one, it says, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Aren't you? You don't you praise the Lord. You can say I did. I did. You know, there's a lot of people that don't believe the report. They don't believe the gospel that was uh, given. And and uh, it's God's grace that we do. It says who hath believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Uh, why is it so many don't believe? It says, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. 
And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Have you considered Jesus Christ created the world? You know, there's a lot of beauty in this world. He's an amazing God. He's a wonderful artist. Surely he could have created his son with a better face. Uh, you know, the Bible says that he, uh, he created him. Uh, he wouldn't stand out in a crowd. He's just average. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't draw attention uh, by his physical appearance. He wasn't some big muscle-bound, uh, you know, a, a tall, dark, and handsome, whatever. He, he was a normal, uh, average-looking uh, uh, person that, uh, you know, I wouldn't, you, you, you'd see a crowd, and he would not be the one you'd draw out of a crowd. Uh, he looks nothing like his pictures, by the way. And uh, uh, those pictures were done by an artist who wanted to honor his Savior, and, and he, he painted what he pictured that Jesus would have been. He never saw Jesus, and, and, uh, and so uh, everybody else copies the pictures from that. But uh, you'd be surprised. And maybe the first thing you'll see when you see Jesus face to face, praise the Lord, you'll see him face to face if you're saved. But the, maybe the very first thing will come out of your mouth before you can catch it is uh, you don't look like your picture. I don't know, uh, you know what it'll be, but uh, but uh, uh, you know he, he, the Bible says that he had no form or comeliness that uh, you know that uh, would would desire him. Verse three, he is despised and rejected of men. Uh, in fact, he's the kind of person you wouldn't want to have as your friend. There's no advantage there. Uh, all the crowd they they despised him. It says he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. And so uh, he was not held in a, in a high uh, station. No one would, uh, would uh, say that he was uh, any, any, uh, anything great. Verse 4, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. We picked on him like everybody else. And uh, here he was, the suffering servant, the one carrying my griefs and my sorrows. And, uh, and yet uh, we, uh, we, we picked on him like everybody else. And the Bible says here in, in uh, verse, uh, verse number five, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Uh, if we'd only known what he was doing for us. Uh, but we didn't. Verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him. The iniquity of us all. We're the ones that did wrong. But yet he took the blame. Uh, and the punishment. Verse 7. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He did not stand up for himself and no one stood up for him. He was led up to that cross and and uh, placed upon that cross. He went through those trials and and uh, the, the, the beatings and the spittings and the mockings and and the scourgings and and uh, plucking out of his beard. And and of course, the uh, nailing uh, of his hands and his feet to the cross and the sword in his side and all those uh, those things that uh, were done to him. And he did it without complaint. Not one time did he try to stand up for himself and stop it. Uh, he willingly went through all of that. What would cause somebody to do that? Passion. Uh, passion. Uh, look at verse number nine. And he made his grave with the wicked. Uh, it wasn't enough that he was hung on a cross, but he was hung on the cross between two uh, others that were guilty of death. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the thieves on each side. And so the company he was put just to mock him further. They placed him in the middle with the criminals on both sides. And it says uh, he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Uh, he didn't even have his own burial, his own tomb. He was uh, put in a borrowed one. Uh, but praise the Lord, he only needed a borrowed one, didn't he? Wasn't going to use it very long. Three days and that's it. And it'd be empty and somebody else could use it. And... Uh, the Bible says here, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. There is one man who's never told a lie. Uh, I believe there's only one, though. But there is one man who's never told a lie, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in verse 10, yet it pleased God to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He did rise again. 
Verse 11, he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. I'm included in that. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore shall I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. What could be a word that could picture, and words do create pictures, could picture what Christ did? Passion. Is there a better word? Passion. Uh, Suffering? Definitely, there was suffering. Uh, But what was the motivation? It was passion. Christ's passion for you and I. Look at Matthew in the New Testament, chapter 16. Matthew, chapter 16. Here in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. As Jesus was traveling with his disciples and he was teaching them. He says in verse 21 here, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples. How that he must go unto Jerusalem. And suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. You know, it stood out as I read that verse, the word must. He must go. He didn't say, I, I'm going to go. I must go. Uh, I don't believe that Jesus rejoiced in the cross. Uh, but it was something he had to do. Uh, why would you do something you don't want to do? Passion. Passion would cause you to do things that you don't necessarily want to do and the bible says here must he must go unto jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day look at mark chapter number eight mark chapter number eight eight mark chapter eight And verse number 31. Of course, as he's given the testimony that he is Christ. And uh, verse 30, he charged them that they should tell no man of him. And verse 31, and he began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He must suffer many things. Uh, Definitely not that he wanted to suffer many things, but he must suffer many things. What would compel him to do that? Passion. Look at Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, verse number 25. It says in verse 25, and again, he's referring to those things that are going to come in the end, and yet before... Those times come, as you know, here uh, currently what's taking place. It says, but first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. Uh, but he must uh, do these things. Uh, he had a, a, a compulsion uh, that would cause him to do uh, those things. Uh, it was necessary. Uh, another term that he uses, uh, and uh, we find it in, Uh, Luke 24. Uh, It behooved Christ. Notice verse 24. Luke chapter chapter 24. 
Verse 46. The Bible says, and said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer. And again, each one of these, the word suffer is that term pasha. Pasha. And uh, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer. That word behooved, needful or necessary. That which is needful or necessary uh, for him to suffer. If you want a, a picture, a vision of the passion of Christ, picture the Mount of Olives. Jesus Christ there kneeling on the ground before God his Father. Drops of blood coming from the sweat glands on his forehead. Crying out, if it's possible, let this cup be passed from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but thine be done. Passion would cause you to do that which you don't want to do. Here passion took over. And what was that passion for? It wasn't the passion for the cross. It definitely wasn't the passion for glory. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. Uh, all the angels uh, glorified Jesus Christ. It wasn't that, you know, as the Bible says, that e every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess of things on earth and things... Uh, uh, under the earth and and uh, things in heaven that Jesus Christ is Lord. Uh, it wasn't the uh, desire for gain uh, or recognition. It was uh, a passion for you and I, a passion for souls. Uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It was passion. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, as we think of the passion of Christ. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse number 2. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Again, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He endured the cross. He despised the shame. But it was the joy that was set before him, uh, a passion, uh, a passion for you and I. The Bible says God's not willing that any perish. He's desiring every person to be saved. When he went to that cross, he had a passion for every single person, including you and I. And God doesn't look at us as a multitude and say, I have a passion for this crowd of people, but God sees each one of us individually as individuals, uh, independently. That's why he gives the illustrations like the a man who had the 99 sheep safe and the one lost, and he leaves the 99 to go out and, find the one and he rejoices and throws a party when he comes home and finds it or the uh, the uh, woman who had the the uh, wedding dowry that uh, lost one of the coins and, and searches the house and brings a candle to search the house to find that one and when finds it throws a big celebration because that one uh, was found and and uh, because uh, to, to to God you're an individual uh, God's got a passion for your soul and for mine and for everybody out there that's lost and anybody in here that's still lost, God's got a passion for your soul. He's willing to cross. And I'm using a term he used to the Pharisees, but he's willing to cross land and sea. To send missionaries to the uttermost parts of the world. That you might be saved. He's got a passion for you to be saved. A God who's got such a passion for you, can, can, can you just kind of picture what it's like when a sinner departs this world and enters hell? What that must be like to God. Uh, when a sinner departs this world and enters hell, and he's got that much of a passion that would cause him to go to the cross 
and to take their guilt and their punishment, their place, and their shame so that they could be saved, and yet they still depart and go to hell. If you're not saved, God's got a passion for you. If you are saved, God's got a passion for you. You know, every time that we uh, fall short, every time that we, uh, you know, mess up our life, you don't think that affects God? If he's got such a passion for you to be saved, uh, can you imagine what, he's got, what kind of passion he has for his own children once you get adopted into his, his family? So the, the point is I was looking at the passion of Christ and his passion for souls, just the question that comes. How's your passion for souls? And how's your passion for Christ? Do we even have a passion for Christ? You know what the the opposite of passion is? The, if you look at the antonym, it's good to look at it. Uh, I, I like to, when I take a word to understand it, look at the synonyms, words that may be similar in meaning, and then the antonyms, those of which are the opposite. What's the direct opposite? You know what the opposite, the dictionary will tell you, of passion is? Apathy. Apathy. And uh, uh, can you just kind of picture, maybe you say, that's, that's me. How many Christians are apathetic when it comes to souls and it comes to the things of Christ and the worship of God and the reading of our Bibles and the obedience of our Savior? Apathy. That's the opposite. You say, well, I fall someplace in between. Probably do. Uh, I'm really not up there with the passion of Christ. Uh, and you may not be either. But I'd like to be closer to that. Do you have a passion for Christ, a passion for souls? 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. What would cause people to suffer for the cause of Christ and s- s- cause them to suffer for the salvation of souls. 1 Peter chapter 1, here in verse number 11. (coughs) Verse 11 says, Searching what uh, or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ, and the glory that should follow. Now he begins this book of First Peter. What's taking place in the book of First Peter is persecution. Uh, the uh, uh, believers in in Peter's day, and and who better to teach about persecution than Peter? Peter failed, didn't he? Uh, they came to him and and they said, "Oh, you you were with him, weren't you?" You know, he even went so far. The Bible says that he cursed to try to assure people that he wasn't with them. Uh, why? Because he was afraid that they might put him on the cross like they did Jesus. You know, Jesus, is, I mean, Peter eventually did get put to death for Christ. Jesus said, Satan desires to tempt you and, and uh, you know, you're going to deny me three times. But when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. And so that's what he's doing with First Peter. He's now writing to Christians who are under persecution. And so he begins by reminding them of the suffering of Christ. And you can find throughout the book of first Peter and even the second Peter suffering over and over. You'll see that term suffering. Look at first Peter chapter two and verse 11. How's my passion for Christ? Well, you could ask, how's your suffering? What price would you be willing to pay? What is it we'd be willing to do to see souls saved or to see Christ glorified. First uh, Peter chapter two, verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. If we could just get that far of being willing to suffer for Christ. Amen. We give some of the bad habits we got. Have that much passion. What's going to cause a person to change their habits in life? Passion. Not God taking away the desire. You having a different desire. The Lord Jesus Christ. 
The Bible says here in verse 12, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. They may try you and tempt you and accuse you and make fun of you and everything else. But when the day of visitation comes, when the Holy Spirit of God convicts their heart, they're going to remember that Christian that they were so mean to. And yet still stood for a testimony for Christ. Verse 13, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. Even if you don't agree. Uh, I don't like a lot of the laws either. And uh, not a lot of them, but there's some of them that I don't, but. Verse 15, for so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Now, they will use that. Even Jesus went and paid taxes, didn't he, to the temple. He had Peter go catch the fish and said, go get it. And, you know, we need to keep a good testimony. Uh, and uh, uh, even if we're children of the king, shouldn't have to pay taxes. Uh, they will use that against you when somebody tries to share the gospel with them. Verse 16. As free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Better skip down. Verse 19. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults ye shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. What's the testimony? Verse 21. For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. His passion for us caused him to suffer. Our passion for him uh, should also. You know, the Bible says all that live godly shall suffer persecution. It's a part of living for the Lord Jesus Christ. You could go on and read it. We're not going to look at all these. You want to write them down. First Peter chapter three, verses eight through 18, the whole chapter talking about the government and persecution and and uh, first Peter chapter four, verses 12 through 16. Again, dealing with this issue of suffering as they're going through persecution, your passion for Christ, that we might have a passion for souls like Jesus Christ has for us. Wasn't the Apostle Paul amazing in the Bible? I mean, have you ever looked at the Apostle Paul and, and, and just uh, it might even be half the servant of God that the Apostle Paul was? Why, why was it that God used the Apostle Paul so greatly? Passion. He had a passion for souls. It was the Apostle Paul that said, I would wish myself accursed if my people could be saved. Uh if God would take all of them instead of me, he said, I'd be willing to go to hell just to see those people say that's passion, isn't it? That's passion. But he knew that wasn't possible. Everyone has to come to Christ on their own. Uh, every one of us have to personally accept Christ as our savior in order to be saved. But he says, if it were possible. Look at first Corinthians chapter number nine. How's your passion for souls? First Corinthians chapter number nine. Nine. First Corinthians nine sixteen. The Apostle Paul says here in verse sixteen, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. That's passion. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, 
Yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might, uh, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law, as without law. Of course, parentheses, because some would say, yeah, that's why I hang out at the bar. It says, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. He was talking about those that were in religion under, as Jews under the law versus those that were Gentiles that, uh, uh, you know, were not. He wasn't saying that it gives you an excuse for lawlessness. I'm going to go out and commit sin so that I can relate to those who, sin, who are, are sinners. Some have actually taken that to, to mean that. But uh, he says here, in other words, uh, in, in verse 22, to the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Uh, unfortunately, everybody that you share the gospel with is not going to get saved. But he says, I'm willing to suffer the embarrassment. I'm willing to suffer the belittling. I'm, I'm willing to suffer all things that I might just reach some. Uh, even if in your lifetime you preach the gospel to thousands and you live for the Lord and nobody wants to be your friend. And you reach one person with the gospel. Praise the Lord. You've already brought back a hundredfold. God saved you. You led another person to the Lord. That's a hundred percent, isn't it? It's not hard to double one. Uh, one other. But don't be settled with one. You say, well, I led somebody to the Lord. So that's that's not passion either. But I'd live my life for souls. Desiring to see God use me and. The Apostle Paul, he says, I'm, I'm willing, even though I'm free of all men, I'm willing to become the servant of all, that I might reach some. Uh, I'll come to the weak as weak, and, and uh, you know, people might laugh at me and make fun of me. Why are you friends with that crowd? Uh, Jesus, why did you eat with publicans and sinners? Uh, why were you even close to them? Don't you realize that uh, they're sinners? But that I might reach one. Romans chapter four or chapter one, last last chapter, Romans chapter one. We know Christ's passion for us. The Bible says God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There's no question. Christ has a passion for souls. It was the Apostle Paul that said the love of Christ constrains us. The love of Christ constrains us. Here in Romans chapter 1 verse 14. Paul says I am debtor. Both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. Both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is. That's passion, isn't it? So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Now, Paul was a Pharisee. Uh, Paul was educated, a member of a wealthy family, Jewish, raised up very prideful, a uh, whole future going ahead for him. One day, Jesus Christ saved him. And now he comes, he says, I am a debtor to the Greeks and to the barbarians. Uh, they called them dogs. Uh, Jewish people were very racial. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, there's very racial people against Jewish people, isn't there? But uh, the Jewish people, uh, you know, in, in Christ's day, they were very racial. Uh, I don't know if they are today. I haven't lived amongst uh, many Jewish uh, people, but, uh, but uh, then they were. And for Paul to come and say, as much as in me is. I desire to preach the gospel to you, Rome also. I'm a debtor. Uh, I owe it with everything in me to get the gospel to you. That you might know how to be saved. A passion. Do you have a passion for souls? Do you have a passion for Christ? Christ has a passion for you. Let's stand as we have the invitation this morning. As I did a study on that term passion and thought of the passion of Christ, it's convicting. 
if I, I could have a portion of a passion for Christ like he has for me. What it took for him to go to that cross and to suffer for you and I. And you know, the Bible says that passion didn't stop there. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. You know, when you ever live to do something, that means 24 hours a day, day in and day out, that's what you purpose to do. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time this morning to look at the passion of Christ. And your love for us, and your sacrifice that we could be saved. And yet we have so little passion for the souls around us and so little passion for your glory and for that relationship and walk with you. Lord, we become so uh, sidetracked and uh, carried away about many things in this world. We have passions for lots of things, but uh, Lord, as we uh, just search within today, do we have a passion for Christ? A passion for souls. I pray, Father, that you bless this invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.